I have to say, this is the warmest venue I've spoken in a long time. And I was joking with Michelle before coming up that saying, you know, when you folks are in the elevator, the temperature goes up. Generally, elevators are quite unfriendly places. And uh, everybody, I mean, no one knew me from a bar of soap, but you just uh, seem to enjoy the company of being with you. I've just only arrived and I missed all the wonderful Halloween. Um, I'm so disappointed about that. And you know, as a former teacher, you just ache for those beautiful, magical um, moments around Halloween where children believe they can be a butterfly or a beast, whatever it is, and how playful of you yesterday to to do that. And last night when I was being driven home, the taxi driver went by the White House and he said, look at that. And I didn't realize I was by the White House on the stupid Blackberry, you know. So um, he said, look at all those children. And they were little children all dressed up in Halloween costumes. And uh, I said, are they lining up for um, handouts from the White House? And he said, yes, um, the White House is dishing out candy to the children. I thought, is that not beautiful? And then I thought about you. You dish out every single day hope. That's what teachers do. You don't just teach. You dish out hope. And my feeling is that you also serve up the future. Because when you teach, you touch the future. Now, I want to thank um, Michelle, I think, who's organized for me to come, and I want to thank Rebecca Spipos, who I met just briefly when I checked in, and such a warm welcome I got there. And also to say, I'm so excited to see Marvin Berkowitz, and I'm going to be able to hear him speak. I've been following Marvin and his marvelous work for a very long time, and it's lovely to see him here with his peeps. Also to give a shout out to uh, to the S.W. Bechtel Junior Foundation who have supported you and they've also supported Roots of Empathy in California. So there's lots of connections here and you know a lot of talk has been going on about the common core and um, also <clears throat> if you think about how we speak about the common cold as well, we share the common cold, we share the common core, it's my wish that we would serve the common heart. And that we have this hope here with teachers because teachers um, actually around the world very often tend to not get the degree of respect they deserve. And in my view, education is really the department of peace. That is in our schoolhouses that we shape the future. And yes, the family is the first teacher. And yes, um, children become themselves at home. But when they come to school, we have a remarkable opportunity to support them and to see them. And the work that we're doing with Roots of Empathy is exclusively in schools. I refuse to be seduced to presenting to middle management. Because middle management really is looking for empathy everywhere we go. They want me to do a little program for middle management. <clears throat> and not to say that they don't need empathy, but the lovely thing is people are beginning to understand that we do need empathy in the world. How will we ever address the intractable social problems unless we understand that in the world we are all the one? And little children who sit around the green blanket do really understand that they share the same feelings as the little baby that they share the same feelings as the Roots of Empathy instructor, and that they share the same feelings as one another and even their classroom teacher. So we bring Roots of Empathy to the classroom teacher as a gift. We set it up so that the classroom teacher can hang out with the children. You know, when you look at teenagers, the world tends to be quite critical of them because they do a lot of hanging out with one another. Um, and not necessarily on track with what we had in mind for them. But they have a need to hang out. And if you look at classroom teachers, they have layer upon layer of expectation. 
And it's so seldom that they actually have an opportunity to observe their children, to be one with their children, to be part of something that they haven't had to organize, that they don't have to supervise. You don't have to have eyes in the back of your head. You're not the police person. So I only work in schools with Roots of Empathy because the power for positively influencing children's lives is with the teacher. So it disturbs me when I hear teachers being um, criticized because I think really they are the windmills to empower the children. Now we need the first slide up. Here is a, a slide I'm just using. I don't plan to use slides. I really would rather speak with you. But I have a few slides and I have a few videos and we're kind of short on time and let me say up front there's a, a wealth of research information on our website so I would rather that you go to that and I have some research summaries if anyone is interested I'd rather we just take the time talking. So here's a typical thing um, in schools we would say if Johnny has three apples and Amelia takes two our typical question would be how many apples has Johnny got left? But the roots of empathy question is different. <laughs> so how Johnny feels determines what Johnny is going to learn. And that's what our whole idea is to be in a classroom, to help children develop emotional literacy. And the trick is we work through the little baby that the children are coached. We have a, a curriculum that's specialized for all age groups up before high school. We don't work in high school, but um, the children find the humanity in the baby and they learn about the baby's feelings and they develop this emotional vocabulary. And um, I, I'd like to show um, the first video now, Ray, if I might, just to give you an idea of what happens in the program. And it's a video with Baby May. And um, just to see how we introduce Baby May. How are you? How are you? How are you? Hello, Baby May, and how are you? How are you today? see baby May weave her magic. Baby May didn't crack a smile once in all of that. And all to say that we talk about the temperament traits of the baby. And when we talk about mood, one of the temperament traits, baby May has a more serious, and some people call it negative, which we can't. We talk about sunrise and sunset, or we talk about serious. She had a very serious temperament, and that gave every child in the class permission not to be a cheerleader. You know, it would be quite an exhausting world if everyone was electric and smiling and outgoing and gregarious all the time. So really the whole point of everything that happens around the green blanket, and I'll show you in a minute, is that we use little babies as an opportunity to understand ourselves. 
so that everything that happens around the green blanket is flipped back by the roots of empathy instructor to the children. And the brilliance of, of the classroom teacher is we never suggest anything. The classroom teachers come up with the most brilliant extensions because they have a chance to see what the children are responding to. And so often, you know, the most uh, troublesome children, the ones who make our hair go gray, are the ones who reveal themselves as being worried or frightened. Um, and it comes out during the year with the Roots of Empathy program. Also the children who self-disclose as being bullies during the year. And I had the most remarkable letter I was sharing yesterday with Michelle that this um, student who was doing his Masters of Education, the class had a presentation from a Roots of Empathy instructor. And after the presentation, he went uh, to his professor and he said, I'm too emotional to speak to you at the moment, but I'd like to write you a letter. He said, when I was 10 years old, I had Roots of Empathy. So in the letter, he said that he only realized about halfway during the year in Roots of Empathy that he was a bully and that he had made this one little boy in particular miserable. And the day he realized that, he went home and he cried all night and he decided that he was going to change his life. And when he came back to school the next day, he didn't speak with anyone and the children noticed he was different. He was probably just exhausted. Um, but he really did change his life and his decision at 10 years of age was that he wouldn't be mean to anybody anymore. He wouldn't hurt anybody. And he said that the reason he became a teacher was that he realized every year when he worked with children, he would be able to help them to be empathic and understand that we all share the same feelings. So we never know what's in the little children's minds. Ray, could we cue up the second video, please? This one um, shows how we discuss emotional literacy. It's a, a different baby, it's a different class. Boys and girls, when Stefana came around to say hello to you today, how did she seem to be feeling? Yes, Beha? Nervous. Nervous? She thought she felt nervous. How about you, Talia? Uh, she felt excited. You felt you, she was excited. What made you think she looked excited? Uh, she was keep on kicking and bouncing. She's kicking and bouncing, yes. Anything else? Yes? She felt happy. You thought she felt happy. What made you think she felt happy? She had a great big smile. She had a great big smile. How did you feel when she came around? How did Stefana make you feel? Yes, Cheyenne? Stefana made me feel happy. And how did she make you feel? She made me feel proud to be here. Proud to be here. Thank you. The proud to be here, we talk about intrinsic pride. And there are many, many stories of children on intrinsic pride. Typically, we feel proud of our accomplishments, our degrees, our awards. We want children to have an intrinsic sense of pride that no one can take your trophy away. And the one story that impressed me so much, a little girl, I was visiting the classroom, and the activity was to share with a classmate a time that you felt proud of yourself that nobody knows about. And uh, this little girl couldn't come up with anything. So I said, well, maybe before I leave, you can tell me if you think of something. I'll come back and chat with you. And finally, I came back. And um, she said, I thought of something. I said, all right, let's hear it. And she said, I'm proud that I never told my mom that my braces hurt. So I was bewildered. And I said, can you tell me a little more about that? And she said, my mommy took another job in the nighttime at the grocery store to pay for my braces. And you know, if we think the children don't have the capacity to understand how others feel, um, they have incredibly deep capacity. They don't often have the opportunity to tell themselves. We also work with the concept of intrinsic um, motivation. And, um, Am I back here on the, the slides? Um, if you, yeah. Um, so just to sort of shore up emotional literacy before we move on, the process is we observe it and label it experientially. 
And as teachers, we all know that experiential learning really is bringing together cognition and emotion, and that's why it's very deep learning. And according to Michael Fullan, it doesn't get deeper than that. So we f reflect, we stop, we work very slowly, we allow silences, we give the children opportunities to learn how to reflect, and then they hear one another speak and share, so they're able to understand the emotions of others. And then it's creating the opportunities to become fluent with your emotions, with speaking of your emotions. So here is perspective taking and emotional literacy. And these really are two of the core aspects of empathy. The perspective taking is a cognitive aspect of empathy. And that's what we do with the baby. The children are coached to observe the baby's intentions and the baby's emotions. So um, in emotional literacy, we ask them why they think the baby is crying. Now I worked for many years with families who hurt their children, who killed their children. And I can tell you that they really didn't understand that babies are people that babies have emotional needs. You know, that baby isn't tired, wet, cold, or hungry. What right has that baby got to cry? Well, if you understood that babies cry because they're worried, babies cry because they're lonely, babies cry because they need to be held, and that's legitimate, don't we all? So it's my goal that every child we touch will understand the humanity of the most vulnerable of our, all of our people, which is the little baby. So this child understood, this child is seven, understood loneliness. And let me say, we have a pandemic of loneliness. The sad thing I've learned the children in three continents, it doesn't matter what the culture or language, children in this internet.com world are feeling lonely. You know, screens aren't relationships. We spend so much time with screens, and I'm pro-technology but they can never replace another living, breathing human being. We don't learn language through language programs on the screen. We learn language through relationship. We become human through relationships. So to think that we can get out of a screen humanity, no, sir. So um, this other one, emotional literacy on reflection, this little girl drew a picture about a time when um, she felt um, sad. And it turns out it was a Monday morning, and she drew a picture about calling 911 because her mother had overdosed. She didn't understand that. Her mother was an addict, living alone in an illegal boarding house. So she called 911 because her teacher had taught her to call 911. And um, the neighbor took her in. The poor school teacher knew nothing about this until this picture came up at 10.30 in the morning. That little girl came to school not knowing how her mom was. Her mom was OK, as it turns out. But her mom went from hospital to jail. So we really are able to reach the deepest core of who we are. And who we are is how we feel. So this little one, in terms of intrinsic motivation and intrinsic pride, she was proud of herself because she stood up against injustice. She was able to help her friend because people were making fun of her friend. And you know, we can't see everything as teachers. A lot of the cruelty happens where the teacher doesn't hear and can't see. But if the children are raging against injustice and standing up for fairness, we have a hope. We can't do it all as teachers. The best thing we do as teachers is to coach the children. And let me tell you, the best example they have is how you are and who you are, not what you teach. It's how you reach. And you reach them in your humanity. Yes, you can only teach them once you've reached them. And I think sometimes teachers don't appreciate how very deeply they influence children. Your every glance, your smile, your high five, you're acknowledging someone's presence, make a huge difference to some vulnerable children. So um, before we do the research results, could we um, have the next video, please, Ray? It's called 18 Questions. It just shows in this little clip, which we caught accidentally, but I'm thrilled, this Roots of Empathy instructor asks the children 18 questions. We counted them. Now, they're not typical questions like how many legs and what color. 
they are questions that talk to what do you observe and do you remember and what do you imagine? And I wonder. We should wonder a lot. Children need to wonder. So um, let's just see what baby, how, same little baby, baby May. I found three clips of baby May, so this is the third. Let's see what she can do. Do you want to play with this? What does that sound like? What's the, what's the sound? I want this toy. So she's saying she wants this toy, but the whole sound she's making. Let's put this out here. Let's see what happens. Okay, now is this, do you think she'll be able to get this? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's watch her. Oh, she was Oh. Now what's she going to do? Yes, let's see if she keeps trying. What happened? Can I pick you up? Do you need help? Can I pick you up? Okay. Did she get upset when she tipped over? No. No, so is she easily frustrated? No. No, no she's not. Let's try let's try and put her back hand again. Sure. Put her back a little bit closer again. And she's ready to do something else. Let's see if she tries again. It's dancing. Need to try again? <laughs> what do you think? No. Do you think she wants to try? No. He, he, he wants to try again. Do you think she wants to try again? See, look at her body's reaching. Let's try and see what happens. Does anybody remember when she was learning to roll yes. over? Oh, she kept trying. Oh. 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 So when we all cheer for the most vulnerable in our midst, the solidarity that develops around the green blanket is amazing. And um, we really don't just teach through the baby, it's through the attachment relationship. We are all born with the capacity for empathy, but it's within that attachment relationship that it either blooms or fades. And it's why we teach through the attachment relationship. And we never mention the attachment relationship, but the instructor will talk all the time about, I wonder why baby May looked to her mommy when she fell down. Because what baby May is saying, as one of the children said, am I really hurt or should I carry on? Now that's exactly right. Because we look to the parent to understand how shall I interpret this experience? And you know what? Children look to you to know how should I interpret this experience? And you know where they spoke, she um, spoke to the children and said, so is baby May easily frustrated? And what happened afterwards, which I can't show the whole thing, but the children talked about who amongst us is easily frustrated and how can we help one another? And when do we notice when someone is frustrated? So all of the um, temperament traits, particularly intensity, um, the children who have high intensity have meltdowns when they're disappointed or when their feelings are hurt. They have a big reaction. And to understand that that's not a moral flaw, that's a temperament trait and we can help one another with that, is a very big difference in, in the supportive learning environment that can develop in the classroom to see ourselves as big babies. The Roots of Empathy instructor often says to the children, you know, how would you feel if when our baby comes to school, somebody says, you can't play, or you've got the cooties, or any of the mean things you can see children saying to one another, there's moral outrage. Nobody would ever hurt our baby, but aren't we all bigger babies? Now, the thing is, a baby isn't a small adult. A baby and a child are completely different, but we all started out the same. And to be able to identify the common core of our humanity is our feelings. And 
Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the research results here. On balance, um, actually I'll let you read, this is not a, a reading quiz. Um, but the idea that the overall research from three continents and dozens of studies shows that aggression comes down significantly and stays down in a longitudinal randomized study going three years post having the program. They found that not only did the aggression stay down and the comparison group, it went up. The social and emotional competence went hugely up, pro-social behaviors, and actually kept going up, whereas the comparison group it went down. So what this means is the experience is biologically embedded in the children's brains. They have changed, and right now in the University of Washington, um, they're doing some uh, brain-based research on eight-year-old children who have had roots of empathy compared to another group who have not had roots of empathy, and they're looking at emotional regulation, uh, self-regulation, which is the huge thing that happens in Roots of Empathy, the children learn how to down-regulate their feelings, which means behavior changes. So we'll be very interested in seeing how that works in Northern Ireland as a post-conflict program, and they're measuring over a long number of years, are these little children more peaceful? Are these little children better able to understand the other? so that they can eclipse the generational sectarian violence that has informed every playground in that country. It's a tragedy. So I guess all to say that, because I want to stop to respect your timing, um, Roots of Empathy is a program that really works within the classroom because the classroom works. And that's why we do it. We do have Seeds of Empathy for Little Wee Children. Um, if anybody would want a copy of this presentation, I would be happy to share it. Um, sorry, the videos just don't share so well, but um, we do have all of these um, things available, and I'm just looking for the very last video to um, share with you because it's our little baby May, and I want to show you what can happen to the mood of a baby over the course of a school year the next little clip I'm going to show you is the very last class of Baby May. She's outgrown her uniform. Here's our uniform. So she outgrew her uniform, and we didn't have the right size shirt. So the children were really upset. Now I have ordered the right size shirt for all the babies because our babies in New Zealand, our Maori babies, are they're like baby Buddhas. Here you go. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon. See So baby May captured the hearts of these children and allowed them to find their own hearts. Um, three days ago, I was in Chile, and uh, the presentation I gave was in this beautiful build building. It was the Gabriel Mistral uh, Cultural Center. And Gabriel Mistral, if, we might not know her in North America, but she was a Nobel laureate, and her poetry was profound and she had a very good focus on children. And she wrote this beautiful poem, and the final phrase of the poem was, for the child we cannot wait, their time is today. Thank you so much.